to remind members that masks are to be worn by the attendees at all times when indoors, except when directly addressing the meeting. Due to the temporary closure of the east side emergency doors, in the event of fire or an emergency which requires an evacuation, please use the west, west side emergency doors and the stairway next to the elevator banks. Those in the third and fourth balconies, please use the stairway next to the elevator banks. Before proceeding to the general debate, as announced in the journal, the General Assembly will hear an introduction by the Secretary General of his annual report on the work of the organization under agent item 113 in accordance with the resolution 51-241 and notwithstanding of provisions in decision 77-54. We shall proceed accordingly. <clears throat> now I give the floor to the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our world is in big trouble. Divides are growing deeper, inequalities are growing wider, and challenges are spreading farther. But as we come together in a world teeming with turmoil, an image of promise and hope comes to my mind. This ship is the brave commander. It sailed the Black Sea with the UN flag flying high and proud. On one hand, what you see is a vessel like any other plying the seas. But look closer. At its essence, this ship is a symbol of what we can accomplish when we act together. It is loaded with Ukrainian grain destined for the people of the Horn of Africa millions of whom are on the edge of famine. It navigated through a war zone, guided by the very parties to the conflict, as part of an unprecedented comprehensive initiative to get more food and fertilizer out of Ukraine and Russia, to bring desperately needed relief to those in need, to calm commodity markets, secure future harvests, and lower prices for consumers everywhere. Ukraine and the Russian Federation, with the support of Turkey, came together to make it happen, despite the enormous complexities, the naysayers, and even the hell of war. Some might call it a miracle on the sea. In truth, it is multilateral diplomacy in action. The Black Sea Grain Initiative has opened the pathway for the safe navigation of dozens of ships filled with much-needed food supplies. But each ship is also carrying one of today's rarest commodities, hope. Excellencies, we need hope, and more, we need action. To ease the global food crisis, we now must urgently address the global fertilizer market crunch. This year, the world has enough food. The problem is distribution. But if the fertilizer market is not stabilized, next year's problem might be food supply itself. We already have reports of farmers in West Africa and beyond cultivating fewer crops because of the price or lack of availability of fertilizers. It is essential to continue removing all remaining obstacles to the export of Russian fertilizers and their ingredients, including ammonia. 
these products are not subject to sanctions and we will keep up our efforts to eliminate indirect effects. Another major concern is the impact of high gas prices on the production of nitrogen fertilizers, and these must also be addressed seriously. Without action now, the global fertilizer shortage will quickly morph into a global food shortage. Excellencies, we need action across the board. Let's have no illusions. We are in rough seas. A winter of global discontent is on the horizon. A cost of living crisis is raging, trust is crumbling, inequalities are exploding, and our planet is burning. People are hurting, with the most vulnerable suffering the most. The United Nations Charter and the ideals it represents are in jeopardy. We have a duty to act, and yet we are gridlocked in colossal global dysfunction. The international community is not ready or willing to tackle the big, dramatic challenges of our age. This crisis threatened the very future of humanity and the fate of our planet. Crises like the war in Ukraine and the multiplication of conflicts around the globe, climates like the climate emergency and biodiversity loss, crises like the dire financial situation of developing countries and the fate of the Sustainable Development Goals, and crises like the lack of guardrails Allowing around promising new technologies to heal disease, connect people, and expand opportunity. In just the time since I became Secretary General, a tool has been developed to edit genes. Neurotechnology, connecting technology with the human nervous system, has progressed from idea to proof of concept. Cryptocurrencies and other blockchain technologies are widespread, but across a host of new technologies, there is a forest of red flags. Social media platforms, based on a business model that monetizes outrage, anger, and negativity, are causing untold damage to communities and societies. Hate speech, misinformation, and abuse, targeted especially at women and vulnerable groups, are proliferating. Our data is being bought and sold to influence our behavior, while spyware and surveillance are out of control, all with no regard for privacy. Artificial intelligence can compromise the integrity of information systems, the media, and indeed, democracy itself. Quantum computing could destroy cybersecurity and increase the risk of malfunctions to complex systems. We don't have the beginnings of a global architecture to deal with any of these. Excellencies. Progress on these issues and more is being held hostage by geopolitical tensions. Our world is in peril and paralyzed. Geopolitical divides are undermining the work of the Security Council, undermining international law, undermining trust and people's faith in democratic institutions, undermining all forms of international cooperation. We cannot go on like this. Even the various groupings set up outside the multilateral system by some members of the international community have fallen into the trap of geopolitical divides like in the G20. At one stage, international relations seem to be moving towards a G2 world. Now we risk ending up with a G nothing. No cooperation, no dialogue, no collective problem solving. But the reality is that we live in a world where the logic of cooperation and dialogue is the only path forward. No power or group alone can call the shots. No major global challenge can be solved with a coalition of the willing. We need a coalition of the world. Excellence, aujourd'hui. Excellencies, today I want to outline three areas where the coalition of the world must urgently overcome divisions and act together. It starts with a core mission of the United Nations, achieving and sustaining peace. Much of the world's attention remains focused on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The war has unleashed widespread destruction with massive violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. The latest reports on burial sites in Izium are extremely disturbing. 
The fighting has claimed thousands of lives, millions have been displaced, billions across the world are affected. We are seeing the threat of dangerous divisions between West and South. The risks to global peace and security are immense. We must keep working for peace in line with the United Nations Charter and international law. At the same time, conflicts and humanitarian crises are spreading, often far from the spotlight. The funding gap for a global humanitarian appeal stands at $32 billion, the widest gap ever. Upheaval abounds. In Afghanistan, the economy is in ruins. Over half of all Afghans face extreme levels of hunger, while human rights, particularly the rights of women and girls, are being trampled. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, armed groups in the east are terrorizing civilians and inflaming regional tensions. In the Horn of Africa, an unprecedented drought is threatening the lives and livelihoods of 22 million people. In Ethiopia, fighting has resumed, underscoring the need for the parties to immediately cease hostilities and return to the peace table. In Haiti, gangs are destroying the very building blocks of society. In Libya, divisions continue to jeopardize the country. In Iraq, divisions, uh, or rather ongoing tensions, threaten stability. In Israel and Palestine, cycles of violence under the occupation continue as prospects for peace based on a two-state solution grow ever more distant. In Myanmar, the appalling humanitarian, human rights, and security situation is deteriorating by the day. In the Sahel, alarming levels of insecurity and terrorist activity amidst rising humanitarian needs continue to grow. In Syria, violence and hardship still prevail. The list goes on. Meanwhile, nuclear saber-rattling and threats to the safety of nuclear plants are adding to global instability. The review conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty failed to reach consensus and a nuclear deal with Iran remains elusive. But there are some glimmers of hope. In Yemen, the nationwide trade truce is fragile but holding. In Colombia, the peace process is taking root. We need much more concerted action everywhere anchored in respect for international law and the protection of human rights. In this splintering world, we need to create mechanisms of dialogue and mediation to heal divides. This is why I outlined elements of a new Agenda for Peace in my report on our common agenda. We are committed to make the most of every diplomatic tool for the Pacific settlement of disputes as set out in the United Nations Charter. Negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and judicial settlement. Excellencies, women's leadership and participation must be front and center, and we all must, must also prioritize prevention and peace building. That means strengthening strategic foresight, anticipating flashpoints that could erupt into violence, and tackling emerging threats posed by cyber warfare and lethal autonomous weapons. It means also expanding the role of regional groups, strengthening peacekeeping, intensifying disarmament and non-proliferation, preventing and countering terrorism, and ensuring accountability. And it means recognizing human rights as pivotal for prevention. My call to action on human rights highlights the centrality of human rights, refugee, and humanitarian law. In all we do, we must recognize that human rights are the path to resolving tensions, ending conflict, and for forging lasting peace. Excellencies, there is another battle we must end. 
our suicidal war against nature. The climate crisis is the defining issue of our time, and it must be the first priority of every government and multilateral organization. And yet, climate, check, climate is action is being put on the back burner, despite overwhelming public support around the world. Global greenhouse gas emissions need to be slashed by 45% by 2030 to have any hope of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. And yet emissions are going up at record levels on course to a 14% increase this decade. We have a rendezvous with climate disaster. I recently saw it with my own eyes in Pakistan, where one third of the country is submerged by a monsoon on steroids. We see it everywhere. Planet Earth is a victim of scorched Earth policies. The past year has brought us Europe's worst heat wave since the Middle Ages. Mega drought in China, the United States and beyond. Famine stalking the Horn of Africa. One million species at risk of extinction. No region is untouched. And we ain't seen nothing yet. The hottest summers of today may be the coolest summers of tomorrow. Once in a lifetime climate shocks may soon become once a year events. And with every climate disaster, we know that women and girls are the most affected. The climate crisis is a case study in moral and economic injustice. The G20 emits 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions, but the poorest and most vulnerable, those who contributed least to this crisis, are bearing its most brutal impacts. Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industry is feasting on hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies and windfall profits, while households' budgets shrink and our planet burns. Excellencies, let's tell it like it is. Our world is addicted to fossil fuels, and it's time for an intervention. We need to hold fossil fuel companies and their enablers to account. And that includes the banks, private equity, asset managers, and other financial institutions that continue to invest and underwrite carbon pollution. It includes the massive public relations machine raking in billions to shield the fossil fuel industry from scrutiny. Just as they did for the tobacco industry decades before, lobbyists and spin doctors have spewed harmful misinformation. Fossil fuel interests need to spend less time averting a PR disaster and more time averting a planetary one. Of course, fossil fuels cannot be shut down overnight. A just transition means leaving no person or country behind. But it's high time to put fossil fuel producers, investors and enablers on notice. Polluters must pay. And today I'm calling on all developed economies to tax the windfall profits of fossil fuel companies. Those funds should be redirected in two ways, to countries suffering loss and damage caused by the climate crisis and to people struggling with rising food and energy prices. As you heard to the COP27 UN Climate Conference in Egypt, I appeal to all leaders to realize the goals of the Paris Agreement. Lift your climate ambition. Listen to your people's calls for change invest in solutions that lead to sustainable economic growth. And let me point to three. First, renewable energy. It generates three times more jobs. It's already cheaper than fossil fuels, and it's the best way to energy security, stable prices, and new industries. But developing countries need help to make this shift, including through international coalitions to support just energy transitions in key emerging economies. Second, helping countries adapt to worsening climate shocks. Resilience building in developing countries is a smart investment in a reliable supply chains, regional stability, and orderly migration. Last year in Glasgow, developed countries agreed to double adaptation funding by 2025. These must be delivered in full as a starting point. At minimum, Adaptation must make up half of all climate finance. And multilateral development banks must step up and deliver. Major economies are their shareholders and must make it happen. Third, 
addressing loss and damage for disasters. It's high time to move beyond endless discussions. Vulnerable countries need meaningful action. Loss and damage are happening now, hurting people and economies now, and must be addressed now, starting at COP27. This is a fundamental question of climate justice, international solidarity, and trust. And at the same time, we must make sure that every person, community, and nation has access to effective early warning systems within the next five years. And we must address the biodiversity crisis by making the December UN Biodiversity Conference a success. The world must agree on a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, one that sets ambitious targets to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, provides adequate financing, and eliminates harmful subsidies that destroy ecosystems on which we all depend. And I also urge you to intensify efforts to finalize an international legally binding agreement to conserve and sustainably use marine, mar marine the biological diversity. We must protect the ocean now and for the future. Excellencies, the climate crisis is coming on top of other heavy weather. A once-in-a-generation global cost of living crisis is unfolding turbocharged by the war in Ukraine. Some 94 countries, home to 1.6 billion people, many in Africa, face a perfect storm. Economic and social fallout from the pandemic, soaring food and energy prices, crashing debt burdens, spiraling inflation, and the lack of access to finance. These cascading crises are feeding on each other, compounding inequalities, creating devastating hardship, delaying the energy transition, and threatening global financial meltdown. Social unrest is inevitable, with conflict not far behind. And it doesn't have to be this way. A world without extreme poverty, want or hunger, is not an impossible dream. It is within reach. This is the world envisaged by the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals but it is not the world we seem to have chosen. Because of our collective decisions, sustainable development everywhere is at risk. The SDGs are issuing an SOS. Even the most fundamental goals on poverty, hunger, and education are going into reverse. More people are poor, more people are hungry, more people are being denied health care and education. Gender equality is going backwards, and women's lives are getting worse, from poverty to choices around sexual and reproductive health to their personal security. Excellencies, developing countries are getting hit from all sides, and we need concerted action. Today, I'm calling for the launch of an SDG stimulus, led by the G20, to massively boost sustainable development for developing countries. The upcoming G20 summit in Bali is the place to start. This SDG stimulus has four components. First, multilateral development banks, the World Bank and regional counterparts, must increase concessional funding to developing countries linked to investments in the Sustainable Development Goals. And the bank themselves need more finance immediately. And then they need to lift their borrowing conditions and increase their appetite for risk so the funds reach all countries in need. Developing countries, particularly small island developing states, face too many obstacles in accessing the finance they need to invest in their people and their future. Second, debt relief. The debt service suspension initiative should be extended and enhanced. But we also need an effective mechanism of debt relief for developing countries, including middle-income countries in debt distress. Creditors should consider debt reduction mechanism, such as debt climate adaptation swaps. And this could have saved lives and livelihoods in Pakistan, which is drowning not only in flood water, but in debt. Lending criteria should go beyond gross domestic product and include all the dimensions of vulnerability that affect developing countries. Third, an expansion of liquidity. I urge the International Monetary Fund and major central banks to expand their liquidity facilities and currency lines immediately and significantly. 
Special drawing rights play an important role in, in enabling developing countries to invest in recovery and the SDGs. But they were distributed according to existing quotas, benefiting those who need them least. We have been waiting for a reallocation for 19 months, and the amounts we hear about are minimal. A new allocation of special drawing rights must be handled differently based on justice and solidarity with developing countries. Fourth, I call on governments to empower specialized funds like Gavi, the Global Fund, and the Green Climate Fund. G20 economies should underwrite an expansion of these funds as additional financing for the SDGs. Excellencies, let me be clear. The SDG stimulus I'm proposing is essential, but it is only an interim measure. Today's global financial system was created by rich countries to serve their interests many decades ago. It expands and entrenches inequalities. It requires deep structural reform. And my report on our common agenda proposes a new global deal to rebalance power and resources between developed and developing countries. African countries in particular are rendered represented in global institutions. I hope member states will seize the opportunity to turn these ideas into concrete solutions, including at the Summit of the Future in 2024. Excellencies, the divergence between developed and developing countries, between North and South, between the privileged and the rest, is becoming more dangerous by the day. It is at the root of geopolitical tensions and lack of trust that poison every area of global cooperation from vaccines to sanctions to trade. But by acting as one, we can nurture fragile shoots of hope. The hope found in climate and peace activists around the world, calling out for change and demanding better of their leaders. The hope found in young people working every day for a better, more peaceful future. The hope found in women and girls leading and fighting for those still being denied their basic human rights. The hope found throughout civil society seeking ways to build more just and equal communities and countries. And the hope found in science and academia racing to stay ahead of deadly diseases and then the COVID-19 pandemic. The hope found in humanitarian heroes rushing to deliver life-saving aid around the world. The United Nations stands with them all. We know lofty ideals must be made real in people's lives, so let's develop common solutions to common problems, grounded in goodwill, trust, and the rights shared by every human being. Let's work as one, a coalition of the world, as United Nations. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General. The Assembly will now turn to agenda item eight, entitled General Debate. Mr. Secretary General, distinguished heads of state and government, excellencies, friends, the world needs solutions through sustain solidarity, sustainability, and science. Solutions because we have drafted many treaties, set excellent goals, yet have taken too little action. We need solidarity because inequalities have reached record heights. We need sustainability because we owe it to our children 
to leave behind a livable world. We need science because it offers us neutral evidence for our actions. My sincere gratitude goes to all member states, especially to Hungary and the Eastern European group for giving me the mandate to turn this motto into reality. Excellencies, we gather today at the most consequential moment of the last four decades. Des chaleurs extrêmes aux inondations dévastatrices. Extreme flooding, extreme heat, climate change it is uh, shared by our communities. Our consumption and our means of production are tearing our planet apart from the earth to the sky. We are living in an ongoing state of humanitarian crisis. More than 300 million people are urgently need humanitarian assistance and protection. And this is an increase of 10 percent since last January. The world food crisis has reached an alarming level because of uh, climate change, conflict, and the COVID-19 pandemic. The food and the energy crisis have pushed at least 70 million people into poverty. Inflation in the meantime is at the highest level for over the past 40 years. One fourth of the entire population of the planet is living in conflict areas, in areas where armed hostilities take place or where there is political instability. Violence has rarely been as harsh throughout the world before. Have imagined that war would return to Europe, that the nuclear threat would be back in political discourse to settle a, a dispute with a neighbor. It has been 203 days since the General Assembly adopted a resolution condemning the military aggression against Ukraine. Unfortunately, the bloodshed and the suffering have not stopped yet. In that time, the United Nations, as we heard, and its partners have offered food and shelter to millions of refugees from that country. A landmark agreement on commercial grain exports from the world's best breadbasket offers hope. Diplomacy is at work to release fertilizers so that the shortage we see today do not become the famines of the next year. UN nuclear inspectors are at one of Europe's key nuclear sites, preventing a possible catastrophe. Excellencies, the theme of our 77th general debate is a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. I stand in solidarity with the people of Pakistan, where devastating floods washed away hundreds of villages. You have seen the heart-wrenching scenes of devastation. This can be a window into our future. However, in tackling climate change, we have the solutions. These are rooted in the advancement we have made in science cooperation and climate diplomacy. But we have to want to put them in practice. The International Panel on Climate Change has proven 
an invaluable tool for supporting political decisions to combat climate change and to adapt to its consequences. We should consider repl uh, replicating its success in the areas of water, energy, food, and biodiversity. This would give us a universally accepted scientific foundation for action. Once this high-level week is over, I plan to launch a series of consultations with the scientific community, asking them to help us, bringing the knowledge from microphones, from microscopes to microphones. The 77th session of the General Assembly will be key to preparing the SDG Summit in 2023 and the Summit of the Future in 2024. Next year, we will assess SDG 6 at the UN Voter Conference, the first since 1977. This call could not be more urgent. Water is set to be the next major driver of conflict worldwide. The problem of water is threefold. Too much, not enough, not safe. We have the chance to make a difference in the lives of 2.1 billion people who lack access to clean water. Let us cooperate to make the voter action agenda as transformational, practical, and actionable as possible. During this session, we will also assess the Sendai framework and come to conclusions to improve resilience against disasters. It is vital that these opportunities lead to a substantive outcomes. The building blocks for transformation are at our disposal. The 2030 Agenda, the Sendai Framework, the Paris Agreement, the Addis Abeba Pro Program of Action, and our common agenda all point in the same direction. They describe the world we want and offer the avenues to get there. I'm encouraged that the Secretary General's proposals and the important initiatives by member states mutually support each other. The challenges are great, and they are interconnected, but they are not insurmountable. Ladies and gentlemen, without universal respect to the rule of law, it is all too easy to rapidly slide into treacherous territory. As we all know, in time of crisis, human rights are the first to be compromised. When human rights are under threat, it is our smoke signal, our call to action. It would be remiss to speak of human rights without addressing a fundamental issue found to be lacking in most societies around the world. It is women's right. It is simply unacceptable that every third woman experience violence in her lifetime. As we speak, half of humanity is all too often excluded from decision-making and leadership. But we need every man and woman to live their lives to their fullest potential. It is only by ensuring the inclusion of all valuing the knowledge of all, that we will find solutions to the challenges we face. This afternoon's UNGA platform of women leaders, organized in collaboration with UN Women, may be an answer to this goal. Women heads of state and government will offer their solutions to society's complex problems. Data shows 
that crisis response is more effective when women take the lead. I encourage you to engage substantively with this issue. It has to do with equity and equality, but above all, human dignity. Excellencies, in all these issues, in all our endeavors, I look forward to working closely with the Secretary General, the Security Council, the ECOSOC, and other key relevant institutions of the United Nations. I stand ready to support member states to identify transformative, impact-oriented, systemic, and sustainable solutions. I promise to cooperate with all stakeholders, civil society, young people, women and scientific community, to name but a few. UN agencies, funds and programs are critical to bringing our efforts out of this hole and into our communities. To deliver on the agenda requested by the member states, I count on your constructive engagement, cooperation, and mutual respect to each other. I emphasize that the revitalization of both the United Nations and the General Assembly must continue. Our ability to competently improve our organization will determine its relevance in the eyes of people around the world. I want to advance negotiations on Security Council reform. It is high time that the Council represents the world's population more equally and that it reflects 21st century realities. This is a matter of credibility to our entire organization and our multilateral order. Ladies and gentlemen, crisis management and transformation will require our consistent efforts way beyond one session of the General Assembly. In that spirit, let me finish with some timeless words of wisdom about chances and the risk of letting them pass, uh, pass us by. Things get better when we make them better. Things go wrong when we fail to seize the opportunities before us. Our opportunity is here and now. Let us act. I thank you. Distinguished delegates, before giving the floor to the first speaker for this morning, I would like to remind members that the list of speakers for the general debate has been established on the agreed basis that uh, statements should be no longer than 15 minutes to enable all speakers to be heard in a given, mean, uh, in, in a given meeting. Within this time frame, I would like to appeal to speakers to deliver their statement at a reasonable pace so that interpretation into the other official United Nations languages may be provided properly. I would also like to draw your attention to the decision assembly at previous sessions, namely that the practice of expressing congratulations inside the General Assembly Hall after a speech has been de uh, uh, delivered is strongly discouraged. After delivering their statements from the rostrum, speakers are invited to exit the General Assembly Hall through room GA200 located behind the podium before returning to their seats. 
May I take it that the General Assembly agrees to proceed in this manner during the general debate of the 77th session? It is so decided. Finally, I should like to draw the attention of members that during the general debate, official photographs of all the speakers are taken by the Department of Global Communications. Members interested in obtaining these photographs are requested to contact the Photo Library of the United Nations. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Jair Macias Bolsonaro, President of the Federal Republic of Brazil. I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Jair Messias Bolsonaro, President of the Repub uh, Federal Republic of Brazil, and to invite him to address uh, the Assembly. Hello, that's in the English Channel. This is the English Channel. Mr. Shabak Rosi, President of the 77th General Assembly of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state, heads of government, and heads of delegation, ladies and gentlemen at large, I begin by congratulating you, Ambassador Shabak Karozi, on your election as President of this General Assembly. You can be sure that you can certainly count on Brazil's support. The theme chosen for this general debate revolves around a concept that perfectly applies to the moment we currently live, a watershed moment. Mr. President, our collective responsibility at this General Assembly consists in understanding the actual scope of the challenges that make up this watershed moment and from there build the responses that draw their strength from the goals that we all share. The task at hand is not a simple one, but strictly speaking, we have no alternative. The effort must begin within each of our countries domestically. First of all, it is what we do at the domestic level that gives the measure of the authority with which we act at the international level. Therefore, allow me to speak from my country's perspective. When Brazil voices her views on the public health agenda, we do so with the legitimate authority of a government that during the COVID-19 pandemic spared no efforts to save lives and preserve jobs. Like so many other countries, we focused our attention from the very outset on ensuring emergency financial aid to those most in need. Our goal was to protect families' income so that they could face up to the economic hardships resulting from the pandemic. Therefore, we managed to benefit more than 68 million people, the equivalent to one-third of the Brazilian population. In parallel, we launched a broad-ranging vaccination program, including domestic production of vaccines. We are a nation of more than 210 million people, and already we have more than 80% of our population fully vaccinated against COVID-19. All were vaccinated voluntarily in due respect of one's individual freedom. Likewise, in the economic arena, Brazil has the legitimate authority of a country that, for the sake of sustainable and inclusive growth, has been putting in place reforms to attract investments and improve the standards of living of her population. Under my administration, we uprooted the systemic corruption that existed in the country. Between 2003 and 2015 alone, a period in which the left wing presided over in Brazil, indebtedness levels at the oil state company Petrobras due to mismanagement and politically driven appointments and favors as well as the diversion of funds reached up to $170 billion. 
the person responsible for that was convicted, unanimously convicted in three different court instances. Whistleblowers have returned $1 billion and we paid to the U.S. stock market another $1 billion due to losses incurred by shareholders. But that is the Brazil of the past. We have enhanced public services by reducing costs and investing in science and technology. Today, for example, Brazil is the world's seventh most digitally advanced country. Altogether, 135 million people access 4,900 services provided by my administration. Brazil has been a pioneer in 5G deployment in Latin America. We have also carried out a comprehensive agenda of privatization and concession projects with an emphasis on infrastructure. We have also completed the San Francisco River Transposition Project, therefore bringing water to the Brazilian northeastern region. We have also adopted new re regulatory frameworks, such as in basic sanitation, railways, and natural gas. Moreover, we have improved the business environment with the Economic Freedom Law and the Startup Law. As a result, we now have created opportunities for young people to be entrepreneurs and have quality jobs. Crowning all of this effort to modernize the Brazilian economy, we have made great strides towards Brazil's accession as a full member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Despite the global crisis, Brazil is getting to the end of 2022 with an economy at full recovery. We have high employment rates and a low inflation rate. The economy is back on the path of track, on the path of growth. Poverty has increased across the world under the impact of the pandemic. In Brazil, it began, it began to fall sharply. The figures speak for themselves. It is estimated that by the end of 2022, 4% of Brazilian families will be living below the extreme poverty level. In 2019, it was 5.1%. This reflects a drop of more than 20%. The Brazil Aid Program, a minimum income country designed and established by my administration during the pandemic, currently meets the needs of 20 million families and pays out $4 a day to the poorest families in the country. Employment fell by 5 percentage points, reaching 9.1%, a rate not seen in seven years. We have lowered inflation, with an estimate of less than 7% for 2022. I am pleased to announce that we have had unprecedented deflation in Brazil in the months of July and August this year. Since June, the price of gasoline has dropped by more than 30%. Today, one liter of gasoline in Brazil costs about 0.90 cents of one dollar. The price of electricity has also dropped by more than 15%. Let me emphasize that the cost of energy has not dropped because of price fixing or any other type of state intervention. Rather, it was the result of a tax rationalization policy designed and implemented with support by the National Congress. In 2021, Brazil was the fourth largest destination country for foreign direct investment in the world. Our foreign trade reached the historic milestone, milestone of 39% of the GDP, even after reducing taxes or lowering taxes down to zero on thousands of products. Domestically, we also have record breakers in three areas, tax collection, state-owned company profit levels, and the public debt to GDP ratio. In fact, in 2021, we had a surplus in the consolidated results or figures for national accounts. Brazilian GDP increased by 1.2% in the second quarter, and the forecast is for up to 3% in 2022. We enjoy the peace of mind of those who are working in the right path, the path to shared prosperity among Brazilians, and beyond that, prosperity shared with our neighbors and other partners worldwide. This is precisely what we see, for example, in food production. Four decades ago, Brazil used to be a food importer. Today, we are one of the world's largest food exporters. And this has only been possible thanks to heavy investments in science and innovation with a view to boosting productivity, yield levels, and sustainability. May I here pay a tribute to Mr. Alison Polinelli, the Brazilian candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize, for his role in expanding the Brazilian agricultural frontier with the use of new technologies. 
This year, Brazil has already started the harvest, or the, the largest grain harvest in our history. We estimate it to be at least 270 million tons. In a few years, Brazil will also make the transition from net import of wheat to a net export of wheat. For the 2022-2023 period, the forecast is that our total production will exceed 300 million tons. As stated by Director General of the World Trade Organization in a recent visit to Brazil, she stated that if it were not for Brazilian agribusiness, the planet would go hungry since we feed more than 1 billion people worldwide. Our agribusiness is a source of national pride. Mr. President, I also wish to call to mind here that also in the field of sustainable development, Brazil's track record of achievements is a source of credibility for our country's international action. As regards the environment and sustainable development, Brazil is part of the solution and stands as a reference to the world. Two-thirds of all of the Brazilian territory remain untouched, covered by native vegetation, precisely as it were when Brazil was first discovered in the 1500s. In the Brazilian Amazon region, an area as big as Western Europe, more than 88% of the rainforest remains untouched and pristine, contrary to what is often reported by the mainstream national and international media. It is absolutely key and essential that when taking care of the environment, we do not overlook people. The Amazon region is home to more than 20 million people, including indigenous people and riverside dwellers, whose livelihood depends on some form of economic use of the forest. We have made or we have brought internet connectivity to more than 100,000 rural schools and more than 500 indigenous communities. Brazil began its energy transition almost half a century ago in response to the oil crises of, the, of that time. Today, we have a modern and sustainable biofuel industry, an industry that currently contributes, positively contributes to the cleanest energy mix among G20 countries. About 84% of our electricity or energy mix is currently renewable, and this is a goal that many developed countries hope to achieve only after 2040 or 2050. Last year, Brazil was chosen or declared by the United Nations as a global transition for energy transition. We have the potential to become a major global exporter of clean energy. We have a surplus already being built up, which can reach more than 100 gigawatts between biomass, onshore wind projects and solar projects, in addition to the untapped opportunity of 700 gigawatt offshore wind farms with one of the lowest production costs in the world. These sources will produce green hydrogen for export, Part of this 100% clean energy opens the possibility for us to become suppliers of highly competitive industrial projects, especially in the Brazilian Northeast, with one of the smallest carbon footprints in the world. The sustainable development agenda is impacted in many ways by threats to international peace and security. We all built the United Nations from the ruins of the Second World War in the last century. What motivated us back then was the determination to avoid a repetition of the cycle of destruction that marked the first half of the 20th century. To a certain extent, in hindsight, we can say that we were successful. But today, the conflict in Ukraine serves as a warning. A reform of the UN system is essential for us to find world peace. In the specific case of the Security Council, after 25 years of debate, it is clear that we must look for innovative solutions. Brazil addresses this topic based on an experience that goes way back and dates back to the very beginnings of the United Nations. It is now the 11th time that we hold a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council. We have sought to offer our very best to achieve peaceful and negotiated solutions to international conflicts, always guided by the UN Charter and international law. Brazil also has an extensive history of 
participation in UN peacekeeping operations, from Suez to Angola, from Haiti to Lebanon, we have always supported peacekeeping. We have also contributed to peace by opening up our borders to those seeking a chance to restart their lives in our country. Since 2018, over 6 million Venezuelan brothers have been forced to leave their country. Many of them came to Brazil. Our response to this challenge was Operation Welcome, which has become an international benchmark reference. More than 350,000 Venezuelan nationals have found in Brazilian territory emergency assistance, protection, documentation, and the possibility of a fresh start. All of them have had access to the labor market, to public services, and to social benefits. In recent months, around 600 Venezuelans have arrived in Brazil every day on foot, the vast majority of which are women and children weighing on average 15 kilos less than before and running away from violence and hunger. The Brazilian humanitarian reception policy goes beyond Venezuela. We have also welcomed Haitians, Syrians, Afghans, and Ukrainians. Mr. President, the conflict in Ukraine has been going on for seven months already, and it is a source of great, great concern, not only in Europe, but throughout the world. First of all, I would like to reiterate Brazil's gratitude to the countries that helped with the evacuation of Brazilian nationals who were in Ukraine when the, first, or when the conflict first started, especially Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and the Czech Republic. Thank you very much. The evacuation operation was successful. We left no one behind, not even their pets. Regarding the conflict in itself, Brazil has been guided by the principles of international law and the UN Charter, principles that are also enshrined in our national constitution. We advocate an immediate ceasefire, the protection of civilians and non-combatants, the preservation of critical infrastructure to assist the population, and the maintenance of all channels of dialogue between the parties at conflict. These are the first steps towards achieving a solution that will be long-lasting and sustainable. And we have been working in that direction. At the United Nations and also elsewhere, we have tried to avoid hampering the channels of dialogue as a result of polarization around the conflict. Accordingly, we are against diplomatic and economic isolation. The effects of the conflict can already be felt in the world, prices of foodstuffs, fuel, and other raw materials. All of this impact drives us all away from the sustainable development goals. Countries that once presented themselves as leaders of the low-carbon economy have now turned to dirty sources of energy. This is a serious setback for the environment. We support all efforts to reduce the economic impacts of this crisis. But we do not believe that the best way is to adopt one-sided or unilateral and selective sanctions that are inconsistent with international law. These measures have harmed economic recovery and have threatened the human rights of vulnerable populations, including in European countries. The solution to the conflict in Ukraine will only be achieved through negotiation and dialogue. I make an appeal to the parties, as well as to the entire international community. Let us not miss any opportunity to end the conflict and ensure peace. The stability, security, and prosperity of humankind are at serious risk if the conflict continues. Mr. President, I have been an unconditional supporter of freedom of speech. Moreover, under my administration, Brazil has made an effort to bring the right to freedom of religion to the very core of the international human rights agenda. It is essential to ensure that everyone has the right to freely worship and practice their religious orientation without any discrimination whatsoever. I would like to inform here that Brazil is ready, stands ready to welcome the Catholic priests and nuns who have suffered prosecution, rather, have suffered persecution by the dictatorial regime in Nicaragua. Brazil repudiates religious persecution wherever it may occur in the world. 
other fundamental values for Brazilian society with implications to the human rights agenda include the defense of family values, the right to life sense conception, the right to self-defense, and the repudiation of gender ideology. I would also like to underscore the priority we have attached to women's um, rights and protection. Our efforts to sanction over 70 legal norms on the subject since the very beginning of my administration in 2019 is thorough evidence of this commitment. We fight violence against women very strictly. It is part and parcel of our broader priority to ensure public security and safety for all Brazilians. The results are visible in our government figures. A 7.7% drop in the number of murders of women and a decrease in the general number of deaths by murder. In 2017, there were 30 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Now there are only 17. Violence in rural areas has also plummeted at the same time as land tenure by the most in need has increased. Under my administration, we have delivered 400,000 rural property land title deeds, 80% of which given to women. In Brazil, we work to ensure that we have strong, independent women so that they can get wherever they wish. First Lady Michelle Bolsonaro has given a new meaning to volunteer work since 2019, with special attention to people with disabilities and rare diseases. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Heads of State and Government, ladies and gentlemen, last September 7th, Brazil celebrated 200 years of history as an independent nation. Millions of Brazilians took to the streets, called upon by their government and wearing the colors of their flag, our flag. It was the largest civic demonstration in the history of our country, a people that believes in God, the homeland, family and freedom. Thank you all very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Federal Republic of Brazil for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear the address uh, by His Excellency Macky Sall, President of the Republic of Senegal. I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Macky Sall President of the Republic of Senegal and invite him to address the, as the Assembly. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. President of the General Assembly. Dear colleagues, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, Mr. President, on behalf of the African Union, I would like to express my thanks to your predecessor and wish you every success in the discharge of your duties. I reiterate our support to the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, as he carries out his delicate mission in this service of member states. Since our last session, the world has become more dangerous and more uncertain under the combined grip of global warming, security and health perils, and the war in Ukraine. The theme of this session reflects the urgent need to act together to ease tensions, to heal our planet, reduce persistent north-south inequalities and reinstate the importance of multilateralism. The Security Council is called upon to address this first and foremost to make sure that all threats to international peace and security, including in Africa, are handled in the same way. Terrorism, which is gaining ground on the continent is not just an African matter. It is a global threat that falls under the primary responsibility of the Council 
as it is the guarantor of the collective security mechanism under the charter of our organization. We, therefore, urge the Council to engage more with us in the fight against terrorism in Africa and to do this with more appropriate mandates and more substantial resources. Furthermore, the African Union once again calls for the lifting of foreign sanctions against Zimbabwe. These harsh measures continue to fuel a sense of injustice against, against an entire people and to aggravate their suffering in these times of deep crisis. In the Middle East, we reiterate the right of the Palestinian people to a viable state living side by side in peace with the state of Israel, each within secure and internationally recognized borders. We call for a de-escalation and a cessation of hostilities in Ukraine, as well as for a negotiated solution to avoid the catastrophic risk of a potentially global conflict. The negotiations and discussions are the best tools we have to promote peace. I launch an appeal to put together a high-level mediation mission to which the African Union stands ready to contribute. Nearly 80 years after the birth of the United Nations system and the Bretton Woods institutions, it is time for a fairer, more inclusive global governance that is more adapted to the realities of our time. It is time to overcome the reticence and to deconstruct the narratives that persist in confining Africa to the margins of decision-making circles. It is time to heed Africa's just and legitimate demand for Security Council reform, as reflected in the Ezulwini consensus. In the same vein, I reaffirm our request for the African Union to be granted a seat in the G20 so that Africa can finally be represented where decisions that affect 1 billion 400 million Africans are being taken. I would like to extend my warmest thanks to the partners who have already expressed their support and invite others to give favorable consideration to our candidacy. With respect to economic and financial governance, I draw the attention of the General Assembly to the 2022 Financing for Sustainable Development report produced by some 60 multilateral institutions, including the IMF, the World Bank, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the International Association of Insurance Regulators, and the Financial Stability Board. This report highlights shortcomings in the assessment processes of credit rating agencies and underlines the importance of transparent methodologies so as not to undermine confidence in ratings. We are concerned by the fact that the perception of risk in Africa continues to be higher than the actual risk, which increases the cost of insurance premiums and undermines the competitiveness of our economies. And this is why Africa is renewing its proposal to the Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy and Finance to engage 
in conjunction with the G20, the IMF, and the World Bank, in a constructive dialogue with the ratings agencies on improving their working and assessment methods. In the same spirit, given the unprecedented scale of the global economic crisis, the African Union reiterates its call for the partial reallocation of special drawing rights so needed for the developing countries first and foremost, and the implementation of the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, the unprecedented shock further destabilizes the weakest economies and makes their need for liquidity ever more pressing so as to mitigate the effects of widespread inflation and support the most vulnerable households and social strata, especially the young people and women. In addition to that, there is the need to address new and old health emergencies, including cancer, the silent killer that continues to claim millions of lives across the world. I call for a general mobilization in favor of the International Atomic Energy Agency's Ray of Hope campaign to strengthen the capacities of member countries, particularly in Africa, in the fight against cancer using nuclear technologies such as medical imaging, nuclear medicine, and radiotherapy. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, with the COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt only a few weeks away, Africa reiterates its commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement. At the same time, we wish to reach a consensus for a fair and equitable energy transition as was called for at the Africa-Europe summit last February at the enlarged session of the G7 summit in June and recently at the Africa Adaptation Finance Forum in Rotterdam. It is legitimate, fair and equitable that Africa, the continent that pollutes the least and lags furthest behind in the industrialization process, should exploit its available resources to provide basic energy so as to improve the competitiveness of its economy and achieve universal access to electricity. I will recall that today more than 600 million Africans still live without electricity. Let us also work towards the goal of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars per year to support developing countries' adaptation efforts and to finance the African Adaptation Acceleration Program under the auspices of the African Development Bank and the Global Center for Adaptation. Moreover, we see adaptation funding not as aid, but rather as a contribution by industrialized countries to a global partnership of solidarity in return for efforts made by developing countries to avoid the polluting patterns that have plunged the planet into the current climate emergency. Mr. President, over and above the current emergencies, I have come to convey the message of a continent determined to work with all of its partners in a relational ethic of a dialogue of confidence and trust and mutual respect. I have come to say 
that Africa has suffered enough of the burden of history, that it does not want to be the place of a new Cold War, but rather a pole of stability and opportunity open to all of its partners on a mutually beneficial basis. I have come to say that we do not ignore that Africa faced with challenges uh, which need to be pacified and stabilized. But I have also come to say that we also have Africa as a provider of solutions with an area of 30 million square kilometers, its human resources, with its more than 60% of the world's arable land, its mineral, forest, water, and energy resources. Yes, we have the Africa of Solutions with governments on the job on a daily basis. We have a vibrant and creative young people who innovate, who are entrepreneurial and who succeed. We have millions of men and women who work hard to feed, educate, and care for their families, who invest, who create wealth and who generate jobs. This Africa of Solutions wants to engage with all of its partners in a reinvented relationship that trans transcends the prejudice that whoever is not with me is against me. We want a multilateralism that is open and respectful of our differences because the United Nations system, born out of the ashes of war, can only win the support of one and all on the basis of shared ideals and not local values erected as universal norms. It is by working together, respecting our differences, that we will restore the strength and vitality of the United Nations raison d'etre, which is to save present and future generations from the scourge of war to advance the peaceful coexistence of peoples and to foster progress by creating better living conditions for all. I wish the 77th session of the General Assembly every success. I thank you for your kind attention. On behalf of the, of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Senegal for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. And the Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Gabriel Boric Font, President of the Republic of Chile. I request, request the protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Gabriel Boric Font, President of the Republic of Chile, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Thank you very much. President, Secretary General, distinguished heads of state and government, distinguished guests, for me it is an honor to be able to be with you at this General Assembly for the first time today. I come from Chile, a beautiful country located in the extreme south of the Americas, between the Andes mountain range, the backbone of the continent, and the majestic, uh, breathtaking Pacific Ocean, a country with a diverse geography and stunning landscapes, where, side by side, we have the clearest skies and the stormiest seas the driest desert alongside cities made of rain. 
The people of Chile, as you may know, is hardworking and caring. Thanks to our efforts in just over two centuries, we have gone from being the coldest, uh, poorest rather, colony of Spain on the continent to a thriving, independent, free, sovereign country, a country with enormous opportunities today at the gates of comprehensive development, and we are working for this development to be for all, not just for a few. A country that has a lithium for energy, the means of providing clean energies to the world, a country with long coasts and protected marine areas to care for the environment with the top-level universities to create and share knowledge. I have come to tell you, dear colleagues, that Chile needs the world. The world needs Chile, too. But as you are aware, and as has been clear in uh, the speeches that went before my own, we live in an era of uncertainty and uh, shocks. It is clear that n no country here is isolated from or immune to global shocks or events, and Chile is no exception. Thus, Russia's war Russia's unfair war of aggression on Ukraine, a nation to which we express our solidarity, pushed up fuel prices and led to shortages of grain and fertilizer with a strong impact on our, our economy and certainly of many of your countries as well. Also, also although it is often hard uh, to discuss this, the trade war between the United States and China that began under the Trump administration in 2018 and the, the pandemic destabilized the global economy, affecting both our and your economies. On another level, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, which uh, is a product of its extended political crisis, has generated an unprecedented flow of migration in our region and in our country, putting enormous pressure on our society and institutions. Lastly, as uh, many of you are experiencing, the climate crisis is particularly affecting our continent, the Americas, especially the Caribbean. It also affects the life systems of our people. Chile meets seven of the nine United Nations vulnerability criteria, low-level coasts, arid and semi-arid areas, forests, propension to natural disasters, drought, floods, mountain ecosystems, and urban areas. But our country, as many of yours, many of the Global South, produces and is responsible for a minimum of greenhouse gas emissions. In our case, it's only 0.24%, while the largest economies of the G20, as the Secretary General has just mentioned, produce 80% of greenhouse gases. It is clear nowadays that no country, large or small, humble or powerful, can save itself on its own. As I was preparing this speech, I was thinking how uh, the many interesting speeches telling about the reality of each country could be contributed to from Chile with its small part in building uh, the best possible world. And with the awareness that it is not my place uh, to teach uh, anybody about the problems in the world, I thought that uh, telling you about our recent experience as a country could be useful to those who are interested uh, to uh, derive uh, their own lessons. 
Chile is currently experiencing an intense political process. Almost three years ago, we faced a major political and social crisis. During those days, a great majority of Chilean people peacefully expressed their discontent with inequality and abuse, their pain at the long waits to receive public health care, their frustration at uh, the million-dollar debts uh, incurred as students, their refusal to accept miserly pensions, uh, pensions that are a mere pittance after long years of work. In a few months, uh, we will celebrate uh, 50 years since President Salvador Allende, from, uh, uh, who spoke to this very assembly, from uh, this very podium, about the major social and political changes that Chile was going through at a time. Chile is a country that has for a long time sought the path towards dignity. And although uh, uh, during the democratic governments of the past 30 years, there was a remarkable decrease in poverty and, uh, so and progress on the social front, it is undeniable that the Chilean development model has uh, kept a high concentration of wealth, leading us to be, and this is painful, one of the most unequal countries on, in the world. This an inequality, as uh, is the case in many developing nations, has obstructed our path towards development. Not only that, it is an inherent threat to democracy because it uh, breaks society apart, it destroys social co cohesion, and it therefore hampers understanding and building a freer, more fair future together. The social upheaval Chile experienced in 2019 left many observers, observers puzzled, wondering what was happening in our country. And it, uh, it even uh, left uh, many observers uh, and stakeholders of Chilean life uh, astonished. And uh, the fact is that many were struck uh, by the fact that a country that had uh, such high indices of economic growth and human development uh, showing imp major improvements in the quality of life of its population should have faced such a deep crisis. But uh, what happened uh, to, to my country is no coincidence. It was a result of innumerable episodes of pain and postponement, which simmered and then struck at the very heart of our society. And I want to point out that this can happen in your countries as well. That is why I invite you to plan ahead in the search for greater social justice, to better distribute wealth and power. This should go hand in hand with sustainable growth. And I am deeply convinced that it can be shared and it is possible. Indeed, it is urgent. Unfortunately, I have to say this because we cannot only come to talk about the good things that are happening. This discontent also expresses itself through major episodes of violence, such as the unacceptable burning of subway stations and vandalizing civic buildings. And we also witnessed an uncontrolled level of repression, which led to deaths, injuries, and over 400 people who were victims of eye injuries which was a result of state action, which is, from the point of view of our government and uh, other and and of uh, international organizations, a severe violation of human rights, which must be repaired. It must be made up for. This long history of injustice. Uh, found its voice in October of 2019. But also, and this is a good thing about it, the long history of uh, 
civ uh, civil mobilization and social struggle, which made it possible to return uh, to democracy and uh, the return of Democrats, as President Aylwin said at the end of the past century, was the same uh, struggle which made it possible at the beginning of the 20th century to make progress in rights for workers. In present at the peaceful demonstrations of 2019 were the women of the previous century who made progress in gaining the right to vote, the workers who earned the, the right to leave and uh, the settlers who fought for decent housing. All of these memories and social struggles manifested themselves there. The protection of human rights anywhere by any regime, decent work, social protection, and the struggle against climate change are universal demands which are the focus of our common agenda, led by the Secretary General of this organization, Antonio Guterres, and of the Sustainable Development Goals. These are the values behind uh, this uh, deep unrest, equality, justice, and freedom. Distinguished leaders of the world, the way forward uh, to the peaceful, democratic resolution of the crisis our country experienced was an agreement between the major political forces which made it possible to draw up a roadmap towards drafting a new constitution, one which made it possible to establish the basis of a new social contract, making a democratic response uh, possible to the demands of the citizens. This uh, road opened by Chilean society through protest and social struggle and uh, then uh, politically channeled by the various institutions was uh, expressed uh, through plebiscite uh, in October 2019 where 80% of voters spoke in favor of a new written constitution by a specially elected body to do so. This is a major challenge. It consists of achieving, as never before in history, a, con a democratic constitution written with citizen participation, participation of indigenous peoples, and uh, gender parity, a constitution for everybody, written by everybody. A few weeks ago, the work of the Constitutional Convention was uh, subjected to consultation through a plebiscite in which there was a massive participation, 85%. But uh, this led to a clear rejection of the proposal, 62 against 38 percent. Thus, today we are seeking new formulas to build the meeting place for all Chileans. My personal option in this plebiscite was to approve the proposal for a new constitution, but the result was the opposite. Some want to see the result of the plebiscite as a defeat for the government. And with great humility, I wish to tell you today that a government can never feel defeated when the people speak. In a democracy, the world word popular is sovereign and is a guide for any government. Why am I telling you about this? Because unlike in the past, when differences in Chile were settled through blood and fire, today Chileans have agreed to face our challenges in a democratic fashion. And I'm telling you about this because I'm certain that one of the major challenges for humanity today is that of building democracies that really talk to and listen to citizens. Those who are here at this assembly have the duty of improving our democracies. During the long days of citizen mobilization, the word dignity was often heard. The Chilean people have just expressed giving us a lesson in democracy, which we are learning. Chile has called on its democracy and political actors to rise to the challenges that we have today. 
and we must uh, meet their expectations. As a government, we have received the results of the recent plebiscite with open eyes and hearts. We want to hear what the people is telling us. We trust their opinions, we trust their will, and there are things uh, I want to share very quickly with you. The results are the expression of a citizenry that calls for change without putting its current achievements at risk. Citizens who want a better future built uh, without creating new insecurities, a future of change with stability. As a young person who was on the street protesting not very long ago, I can tell you that representing unrest is a lot easier than producing solutions. Those of us devoted to the demanding work of politics easily confuse our success as spokespeople for citizen unease with our real ability to build a better future. The plebiscite results in Chile have taught us to be humble. Democracy must be humble. They made us realize that uh, building the Chile we dream of, in building the Chile we dream of, no given sector has a recipe. Rather, it is the dish made up of the best each one of us has to contribute. This is how we govern in the 21st century, mobilizing capacity and skill in our societies, not trying to substitute them. As a president, President of Chile, I am convinced that very soon Chile will have a constitution that will satisfy us and make us proud, one built in democracy that br uh, brings together the contributions of all sectors of society, able to reflect uh, our aspirations of justice and liberty. Distinguished delegates, Based on the humble history of my country, I can tell you with deep conviction that the path to face the problems affecting our societies is paved with more democracy, not less, with incentives for participation, not restrictions, with, inc with dialogue and not censorship, and above all, with respect for those who think differently, with inclusion of their points of view, and understanding that having diverse opinions does not make us enemies. I reject the abyss that some try to open when facing the legitimate diversity of opinion. And from Chile, we declare our will of building bridges across those gaps that make it difficult for us to meet as diverse societies. This is what we wish to share as a small country with the nations of the world. Deepening democracy is a permanent exercise where we must persevere and learn from the experience of others. Thus, in conclusion, I invite you to work together to strengthen democracy in all spaces in each of our countries and in the relationship between countries. We need a new Latin America. We need more work together from the global south. We need a modernized United Nations where we all set ourselves the same objectives. We commit ourselves from multilateralism to justice and peace anywhere and everywhere to take the actions needed not only statements to stop the unfair war of Russia on Ukraine and put an end to all the abuses of the powerful anywhere in the world, to mobilize our efforts to stop violence against women, whether it be in Iran, in memory of Mahsa Amini, who died at the hands of the police this week, or anywhere in the world, to not normalize ongoing violations of the human rights of the Palestinian people to uphold international law and the resolutions which this uh, very assembly takes year after year, leading to its right to its uh, inalienable right to establish its own free sovereign state, as well as guaranteeing Israel's legitimate right to live within safe and internationally recognized borders, to continue working to contribute 
to the release of political prisoners and in Nicaragua. And so nowhere in the world uh, having ideas different from uh, the current government can lead to persecution or violations of human rights. Distinguished members of this assembly, the whole world is calling for change. New generations have the right, uh, like those before us, and also the responsibility to think and realize a different future. The citizens suffering the consequences of societies built on segregation and uh, abuse uh, call for their rights and for a safe life. This is a world that can only be achieved through more democracy. And this is a call which we must all respond to today. And in Chile, we are willing to cooperate anywhere in the world to that end. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Chile for the statement just made. And I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Majesty King Abdullah II Ibn al Hussein, King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. I request protocol to escort His Majesty. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Majesty King Abdullah II Ibn al Hussein, King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Your Excellencies. We meet today in this General Assembly as the alarm bells ring all around us. Numerous crises batter our world, crises that are increasingly interlocked. Regional conflicts with international impact, devastating climate change, pandemic disruptions, extremist violence, spiraling inflation, looming recession. And for all too many around the world, the growing reality of hunger. Developing countries have been hardest hit. Is this the future we will leave to the generations yet to come? We must deliver a different world, a world of expanded horizons a more equitable world, sustainable economic growth, exciting new opportunities, and more and better jobs, and the inclusive peace for prosperity in which all people can thrive. To reach these goals, our countries must unite behind effective, collaborative action. The question now is, Will we have the vision and determination to get the job done? Consider the climate crisis. No country can heal our injured earth alone. We need global partnerships that can create real change. And Jordan is part of these efforts. We have been building strong partnerships to manage and sustain vital water resources. And we see more opportunities to work with partners to preserve precious world heritage sites and natural wonders. The unique Dead Sea, the sacred Jordan River, and the resilient coral reefs of the Gulf of Aqaba, which are all threatened by climate change. Food security is another global priority. Hundreds of millions of people go to bed hungry and the numbers are rising. How can parents raise healthy children? How can students learn? How can workers do their best when they are hungry and hopeless? Since the beginning of the pandemic, and now with the crisis in Ukraine, global supply chains have been disrupted. Many well-off countries experienced empty food shelves for the first time in living memory. They are discovering a truth that people in developing countries have known for a long time. For countries to thrive, affordable food must get to every family's table. 
on a global level. This demands collective measures to ensure fair access to affordable food and speed the movement of staples to countries in need. My friends, sustainable, inclusive economic growth has too often been a victim of global crises. But it can also be a defense that strengthens us to endure the storms. In my region, we are looking to build integrated partnerships that tap the capabilities and resources of each of our countries for the benefit of all. We see regional resilience packs coming together to stimulate fresh opportunities and growth. Jordan has established multilateral partnerships with Egypt, Iraq, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and others in the region to capitalize on these opportunities. Our country is a bridge for regional partnerships and cooperation, international crisis response, and humanitarian action. Jordan has always been a source of regional stability as well as a refuge for those in Microphone is red. That means that he works. Ah, well, it's red when he works. Yes, yeah. These and the communities which host them. In 2012, I came before the 67th General Assembly and spoke for the first time about the Syrian refugee flow and its pressure on Jordan's scarce resources. At that point, 200,000 Syrians had sought refuge in our small country. Today, 10 years later, we host more than 1.3 million. Meeting the needs of these and other refugees is an international responsibility. And host countries look to the international community to honor its commitments. My friends, for decades, the Middle East has been synonymous with conflict and crisis. But we are hopeful that a newfound spirit of collaboration can and make our region an exemplar of resilience and integration. Though politics may sometimes fail our world, one absolute remains. Always put people first. To keep hope alive for all peoples means rising above politics to ensure every individual's prosperity. Such efforts will be fruitless if they are exclusionary. Inclusion of the Palestinian people in regional economic projects should be an integral part of our efforts. In a Palestinian-Israeli conflict, peace continues to be elusive. Neither war nor diplomacy has held the answer to this historic tragedy. It is the people themselves, not politics and politicians, who will have to come together and push their leaders to resolve this. What would our world look like now if the conflict had been settled long ago? If walls had never gone up and people had been allowed to build bridges of cooperation instead? What if extremists had never been able to exploit the injustices of occupation? How many generations of youth could have grown up in the optimism of peace and progress? As we continue our efforts to achieve peace, we must not abandon refugees. This year, the General Assembly will vote on renewing UNRWA's mandate. The international community should send a strong message of support for the rights of Palestinian refugees, ensuring that Palestinian refugee children have schools to go to and access to appropriate medical care. My dear friends, a founding UN principle is the right to self-determination for all peoples. The Palestinian people, with their resilient national identity, cannot be denied this right. 
And the road forward is the two-state solution in accordance with UN resolutions, a sovereign, viable, and independent Palestinian state on the 4th of June, 1967 lines with East Jerusalem as its capital, living side by side with Israel in peace and security and prosperity. Today, the future of Jerusalem is an urgent concern. The city is holy to billions of Muslims, Christians, and Jews around the world. Undermining Jerusalem's legal and historical status quo triggers global tensions and deepens religious divides. The holy city must not be a place for hatred and division. As custodians of Jerusalem's Muslim and Christian holy sites, we are committed to protecting their historical and legal status quo and to their safety and future. And as a Muslim leader, let me say clearly that we are committed to defending the rights, the precious heritage, and the historic identity of the Christian people of our region. Nowhere is that more important than in Jerusalem. Today, Christianity in the holy city is under fire. The rights of churches in Jerusalem are threatened. This cannot continue. Christianity is vital to the past and present of our region and the Holy Land. It must remain an integral part of our future. Distinguished delegates, we can weather the most serious crises if we join together. Do let us here in this General Assembly honor our shared interests in a brighter future, a future of dignity and hope that brings new opportunities for all our peoples. And let us not ignore the alarm bells ringing around us. We must act. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Majesty. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Gustavo Petro Urego, President of the Republic of Colombia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Gustavo Petro Urego, President of the Republic of Colombia, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Distinguished President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Chavo Rochi, Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, Your Excellencies, Heads of State, 